Okay. Um, so a brief agenda for today, uh, we'll start with a project overview, what the purpose of the comp plan is and the timeline, and then we'll dive into our environment element and some of the questions and discussion as Katie mentioned. Um, so why we're here, uh, the Board of Supervisors authorized an amendment to the comprehensive plan policy plan um, with three major goals, and those were to review, update, and streamline the existing elements. The second was to ensure that the policy plan is aligned with the strategic plan, One Fairfax, Resilient Fairfax, and other recently adopted or endorsed board plans, and also to add new policies as needed to address topics such as community health and equity. Um, we've broken the project into two phases, and we're currently um, well into phase one with uh, topics such as environment, land use, uh, transportation, parks and recreation, um, and human services under review. Uh, before we dive into the meat of this, I do want to um, provide a brief overview on the difference between the comprehensive plan and the county's regulatory documents. Um, the comprehensive plan is a guide that, serve, that sets the land use vision for the county and is implemented through the development review process of zoning applications. The policy plan includes a number of goals, objectives, and policies. Goals provide the general direction of the plan. Objectives include statements to help achieve those goals. And finally, policies include specific approaches for pursuing an objective. The policy plan does apply countywide, um, and the area plan volumes of the comprehensive plan are the uh, pieces that provide specific uh, site guidance um, and considerations uh, through, through those volumes. Um, the zoning ordinance is a regulatory document that applies to all structures and is intended to promote health, safety, and general welfare of the public, as well as implementing the comprehensive plan. And finally, um, the public facilities manual provides guidance um, and regulations around uh, the construction of new development. Um, to kick this project off, we worked to unpack the policy plan and understand where it stands today. Um, we also started outreach on this project earlier in the spring and summer by hosting six community meetings um, to inform the public of the project and get feedback on what they like or don't like about their communities. And from that, we identified research areas that staff is focusing on to help inform future recommendations, which Carly will dive a little bit more into for her part. Um, we're currently focused in the focus topic outreach phase of the project where staff is preparing research and information with the goal of starting to draft policies based on board adopted documents, the outreach input that we've received from um, folks like you and best practices. The policy development work will continue into 2025 with the goal of received and how it was or was not incorporated and, and why. Um, this phase will our community feedback report phase will be incorporated into our final staff report and staff recommendation. So all of that to say, this is not the only time for engagement. Um, we, we will still be taking feedback and, um, and uh, recommendations um, after, after these meetings. And with that, I will turn it over to Carly for um, the environment element and why we're all here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, so I will, just as a house, I was going to ask, <laughs> so I had the audio breaking up a little bit too. I was wondering if it was just me because I'm in a conference room, but if it's not just me, I'm going to keep going and hope for the best. Um, so this slide is a list of the current objectives in the environment element. Um, and each objective contains numerous policies. So the objectives and policies are categorized into three broad categories, which are shown grouped together on this slide. Um, objectives one through five are, are in the environmental pollution category. Objectives six, seven, and eight are in the environmental hazards category. And objectives nine through 13 are in the environmental resources category. There is also an Appendix 1, which provides guidance for tidal shoreline erosion control measures and emphasizes living shoreline approaches. And there is also a Chesapeake Bay supplement to the comprehensive plan, which was adopted in 2004 to satisfy comprehensive plan requirements of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act. And it provides a detailed evaluation of water quality issues, um, 20 years ago, um, such as pollution sources, infill development, redevelopment, shoreline erosion control, and shoreline access. And it, the recommended policy statements within that document were subsequently adopted within the current policy plan. 
Um, next slide, please. So how is the env environment element used? For the most part, many of the environmental policies are implemented on a case-by-case -case basis as land is developed or redeveloped through comprehensive plan amendments, rezonings, and special exceptions for both private and public developments. And a commonly used objective and related policies is objective two pertaining to water quality. Objective two policies encourage the creation and monitoring of best management practices programs, the minimization of fertilizer, pesticide, and herbicide use, the incorporation of low impact development techniques, meeting tree cover requirements through preservation and exceeding preservation code requirements, and encouraging the protection and restoration of stream channels and associated buffer areas. Another commonly used objective and policies is Objective 13 pertaining to sustainable building and site design. During the entitlement process, development projects typically commit to LEED or equivalent program certification. And our policy on electric vehicle charging is another example of a policy that is routinely encouraged and committed to in the form of charging stations, infrastructure to install future stations, or a combination thereof. Next slide. There are also objectives and policies that provide county directives and encourage coordination efforts with a couple of examples provided here. Watershed management plans prepared by the county's Department of Public Works and Environmental Services provide recommended actions to protect property, prevent erosion, reduce excess nutrients, improve wildlife habitat, and improve water quality. And these plans are also consulted during the development review process. Policies also support the establishment of open space and conservation easements as part of a development project or separately through entities such as the Fairfax County Park Authority and the Virginia Northern Virginia Conservation Trust. Uh, next slide, please. So the next couple slides will provide some examples of the policies in action. Um, Commonly used environmental policies are those related to stormwater management and tree preservation and landscaping. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. I heard a ding. So I <laughs> wanted to make sure it wasn't my mic. Um, so depending on the objectives and policies within the environment element also share similar purposes with those in other elements and county plans. Depending on the type of project and its location, certain policies can be leveraged to provide project features with co-benefits. This is an example of a recently approved project in McLean on Chainbridge Road, and it includes features that serve multiple purposes consistent with several policies, including environment policies, transportation, and recreation policies. So the project includes urban bioretention planners adjacent to the building to capture stormwater runoff from the roof, which then drains to an underground detention vault shown in the light gray squares, which will be under a public park space area. This is consistent with stormwater policies in the environment and parks and recreation elements by providing park space while also employing site design and low impact development techniques. Shown along Chain Bridge Road are street trees, a sidewalk, and a bike lane. And these features are consistent with policies in the environment and transportation elements about providing multimodal transportation choices and street trees, which can lead to improved air quality. Uh, next slide. Another commonly used other commonly used policies are related to green building and sustainable site design. Uh, these two images are from the Capital One building in Tysons. It includes green roof areas that provide stormwater management and urban heat island impact benefits, and as well as providing recreational amenities. Next slide. 
So generally speaking, the environment element contains effective objectives and policies that are incorporated into development plans and provide appropriate direction for county efforts. But we have identified some areas where there is either room for improvement or the scope of an objective or policy could be broadened or where environment, environmental concerns have risen to the forefront since the last policy plan update. The list on these slide on this slide are not meant to be complete since we are continuing our outreach efforts and seeking input. So I'll elaborate on a few of these. So for stormwater management, the areas to improve improve upon could be to better promote the potential benefits that green infrastructure can provide, such as those referenced in the previous slide. And then also some recommendations um, that have been provided in development reviews or plan amendments could be formalized into policies, such as exceeding minimum code requirements for water quantity and quality control, salt management, and soil remediation. The current lighting policy is focused on impacts to humans, so that could be improved to consider impacts to wildlife. The current soils policy is focused on soils that are problematic for development, so a recognition of the importance of Healthy soils for plant health, water infiltration, and biodiversity should be considered. And then the topics of resiliency, equity, and health are ones that are being evaluated across the board for all elements being updated as part of the plan forward process. And an issue that has an example of an issue that has implications to each of these topics is the urban heat island effect, which is not directly addressed right now in current policies. A potential way of addressing this in the environment element is to continue encouraging greater tree canopies, particularly in key areas, which would help address all three of these areas listed. And then there's an asterisk next to three of these, which are um, to identify topics of upcoming white papers, which we're anticipating being uh, published by the end of this year. Uh, next slide. So we have a couple questions to get the conversation started, but this is not obviously um, limited to just these responses to these two questions. We want to hear what everybody's concerns are. So just which topics are not currently addressed in the environment element that should be considered for this update? And then two, our policies fall within the three main groups I listed earlier. And are there any thoughts on if these three categories should be adjusted? Um, so with that, um, I'll open it up to questions and discussion. Sure. And before we do that, I just wanted to um, ask a few, have a few requests here that as we want to allow each person to have an opportunity to speak, again, we're asking for comments to be one to two minutes just so that we can have enough time for, for everyone since we have about um, almost 30 people on the call. If you could use your raised hand function within this Microsoft Teams app, that would be great. If you want to share some feedback, I'll do my best to call on folks in order that I see the hands raised. Um, once I call your name, feel free to unmute. And I will be keeping an eye on the chat, like I mentioned before. And I, I also wanted to just mention real quick, we had a very similar meeting on, on October 15th. So um, for those of you who participated in that previous meeting on the 15th, please understand that we've captured your comments from that meeting and that um, we ask you to keep this in mind so that we have um, opportunities for others to speak. And with that, I saw Keith's hand raised first. So Keith, go ahead and unmute yourself and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. So I'll say I live in Tyson's where it looks like you guys are doing a lot of these good things and a lot of stuff I was really gonna push for, it looks like you guys are doing such as green roofs, living walls, um, bike lanes, that kind of stuff is the biggest thing we can do to help out pretty much all of those things to encourage more density and then do it wise while we're encouraging that density. So like you're doing in Tyson. So I like seeing all that. The main thing I'll say is that you kept saying you wanna encourage people to do that. Are there incentives that you guys are looking to put in to building code, tax breaks, things like that, to not just say, hey, it'd be nice if you did this, but to incentivize people to choose to do it so that they can really, we can get this going 
you know, more. And the other one, I guess I would say is the, my understanding is one of the cheapest and most effective ways to reduce air pollution and emissions is through the increased use of bike lanes, particularly protected bike lanes, um, to encourage more people to get out of their car because the vast majority of the pollution in our county comes from auto automobiles. Since as far as I know, there are no power plants in our county. Um, so I guess that would be my main thing is what are we doing to not just encourage, but incentivize all the things that you talked about. And I guess I really want to put the emphasis on how are we working to get more, not just bike lanes, but protected bike lanes put in throughout the county, um, similar to how we have in Tyson's. Like, how are we getting that to spread throughout the county? Um, with that, I'll lower my hand. Great, thanks Keith for that feedback on the bike component. We will definitely um, include that in our summary of discussion points. And I see that Ting in the chat also kind of supported that that piece as well. Um, Kareen, did you wanna take a crack at the comment related to incentives and see if, sure. Thank you. Um, with with incentives um, and with your, with your uh, comment regarding building code, um, we're not authorized to update the building code with this. This is just the policy document. But through implementing this, we work with developers very, very, uh, very, very strongly to encourage these uh, these items to be met. So when we say encourage, it's not just us saying, "Hey, we hope you can do this." You know. Let us know if you can't, but it's really sitting down with them and making sure that if something is not able to be done, why is that the case? And if 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 that's the case, what's the best solution to go forward to, to still meet what we're trying to get? Um, that being said, there are a couple different incentives that the county has, um, not just through uh, the comprehensive plan, but a couple other, uh, I'll throw one out there, expedited permitting processes. Our land development services team does have a couple of um, ways for projects to move through um, some of the review phases faster if they're meeting certain sustainability um, levels. I believe it was Lead Silver last time I looked. Um, so we are we are working with our counterparts to figure out what incentives are already in place um, and understanding what we can and can't do because we are a little bit limited by um, what the state lets us do. Um, but your point is well taken about incentives and I think um, it's come up a few other times. So I think definitely it's it's on the list and figuring out what we can do um, to make sure that that this happens. But I will say when we do have policies adopted, um, staff is very, very strong and we do have support to to help meet those. So um, I know encourage isn't always the the fan favorite word, but sometimes um, it is what we're what we're able to do. But we do work very hard to make sure that. Things are met, so I hope that helps. Sorry, I rambled for a little bit there. Um, I will let um, the next person with their hand raised go. I think that was David not to steal your thunder, Katie. No, perfect. Yes. Thanks, Corrine and David. Um, feel free to unmute. Thank you. Okay. Oh, there we go. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes, we oh. can hear you. Okay. Excellent. I want to follow up on the last person's um, wonderful thoughts. Uh, incentives are important. Uh, encouraging people to do the right thing is important. Uh, I guess what I was hoping to hear, and you did uh, express this in the uh, comments, which was in your response to our previous uh, uh, questioner uh, about building codes. I mean, I think the, the only way you can really get this done is to say, hey, you guys have got to do this. This is the this is the rule here. And I understand that you can you can't in Fairfax County, we cannot unilaterally change the building codes. That's something that's done at the state level. And I understand that that's an issue. Uh, for you, or can be an issue for you. Um, just a second. I'll be right with you. Uh, so, <clears throat> sorry, I had a phone call there. Uh, so, I, th there's there's one part of it. Uh, the other part of it is I'm delighted to hear that you're taking into account resilience. We've just seen horrible storms go through areas of the country that were not supposed to be affected by hurricanes, for example, and they got trashed. So we've got to harden our infrastructure, and I think that's increased. And there's a we have a resilient Fairfax plan that I'm hoping and, and I'm assuming you're taking into account. Um, just again, uh, can't I mean, see your phone right now? Okay. Uh, then uh, the other thing I was mentioning is what is the impact, or how are you uh, accounting for 
the countywide, uh, community-wide climate action plan. In other words, as we do each of these things, how are we reducing the climate impact of the various uh, projects that are going forward? Uh, you know, from building buildings to uh, uh, doing some of the uh, stormwater management things and, and the other things that you mentioned in your discussion, uh, how is that being taken into account? Um, okay. Sure, I can start with this one. And Carly, if you have anything to add, please jump in. Or Katie, um, with the with the climate, the CCAP plan, um, we are working closely with the Office of Energy and Environmental Coordination to make sure that the um, resilient Fairfax and CCAP plans are incorporated uh, to to the maximum extent possible for um, the comprehensive plan. Understanding that. Uh, not everything is appropriate for there, but we are making sure that any updates to our green building policy or our sustainability policies and um, stormwater do account for um, that resiliency and and that building energy um, as well. So I don't have a solution for you today, but we are working very, very closely to make sure that we get there and meet those goals. Okay, good to hear. Thank you. Great. Right. Thanks, David, and thanks, Corrine, as well. Um, up next, I think we have Glenna. You want to go ahead and unmute? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm the tree commissioner for Franconia District, so I'm particularly interested in the trees and the policies around trees. And I notice, you know, there was uh, Objective Ten talking a lot about tree conservation, and you said each has various policies. The tree canopy affects a lot of the things that you're mentioning here in terms of environment, which includes the um, heat island effect, improved air quality, you know, all of those areas, health and well-being as well, which I, I know is another area. Um, <clears throat> I would just like to see as you are, because my understanding from other meetings is that you are looking at existing policies um, as well as perhaps new policies. Um, so I, I would really encourage that the language be very strong around tree preservation because we get more benefit from preserving the trees than having the developers or VDOT cut down the trees and then plant much smaller trees that, you know, it takes a long time to get back to that place. So I would really like to see strong language not just encouraging people, but you know, really trying to um, make something, make make strong points on that, as well as language around using native trees and native plants, um, particularly you know when they are <clears throat> replanting uh, or landscaping a particular area. So I think those are the main things, but you know the urban, I mean, the wildlife corridors, the biodiversity, I mean, all of those things, all those ecosystems are affected by the trees and the tree canopy. So I, I, we, I, I guess we, we really need to protect them. So, you know, whatever we can do as we're looking at these policies, I would just encourage us to really strengthen all of those, that language and policies in those areas. Thank you. Thank you so much for your feedback and perspective there, especially with all of your knowledge on, on tree canopy. Thanks again. Um, why don't we go ahead and move to Ken. Ken, if you would like to speak, we're happy to hear yes. you. I, I did not see any reference to encouraging or incentivizing renewable energy, which mostly would mean solar in the case of, uh, of buildings. Is there a reason that's not uh, identified? This is Corrine. Um, so we actually do have policies around uh, encouraging renewable energy resources in the plan currently, um, and it falls under our green building policy. It's an objective 13. Um, I apologize that that wasn't specifically called out, but we we have been encouraging that since 2007. We will continue encouraging that. Uh, we have no plans to no plans to stop. I apologize that we didn't include that specifically. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for bringing that up and so that that gave us an opportunity to uh, add some more information. Uh, let's see here. Next, I believe we have Sonia. 
Yes, hello, uh, Sonia Brihi. I am uh, I'm with the Coalition for Smarter Growth, um, and I just sort of wanted to um, follow up on some of the comments earlier that was talking about sort of focusing growth and development the areas like Tyson's and whatnot, because I think you know transportation emissions are our leading um, climate pollution and providing more homes and walkable bike friendly communities with good transit is help is how we can help reduce those emissions um, and really give folks more sustainable options to get around um, so i think you know continuing the focus on that is great um, but i also think it's important to think about you know how this plan talks about it and i know um, I've been I think it's really helpful the more we can sort of cross reference policies and I know y'all talked a little bit about that but pointing out how you know to help us get out of the silos and recognizing the intersectionality of these issues but you know at the transportation meeting I was talking about how important it is to talk about environmental issues and street trees and the need to make sure that our active transportation networks um, are human and, you know, we can get out in hot heat, you know, our hot summers um, and street trees really play an important part of that. Also helping to reduce heat island impacts. Um, but if we want to really encourage people to get out and bike and walk, um, we have to make sure trees are part of that. Um, I think it's really important. And I think a lot of times our transportation infrastructure, when it gets built, sort of there's this you know, VDOT clears the trees. So figuring out how we can get more trees as part of that is really an important part of our active transportation um, system. And I think for here, you know, I think we need to talk about sustainable transportation and the need to encourage walking, biking, better transit. And in the transportation section, we should be talking about trees and why it's a climate solution to provide more trees as part of our transportation network, because these really all do go hand in hand. Um, so I just sort of wanted to highlight that. And the more we can sort of build them in into these different elements and talk about them, um, I think the better off we'll be as we plan um, to really address these issues moving forward. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, sort of ask about or just sort of talk about was the issues of lighting. And I know that there are negative impacts of lighting on wildlife, um, but I also want to <laughs> highlight that um, as a pedestrian safety advocate, uh, pedestrian scale lighting is really critical for the safety and comfort of people who have to walk, um, get to the bus stops, things like that. And so I think it's gonna be really important that we find the type of lighting that we can use that is more pedestrian scale in nature, downward facing, that can limit the impacts on wildlife, but also still, ensure um, safe passage for people who have to walk places. Um, and I just don't want that to become a conflict. I think there are solutions. And I hope that as we start to sort of uh, dig into that a little bit, we find better types of lighting that are more specific to what we're trying to illuminate and not just flooding the entire area. So I just wanted to highlight the, the need for better lighting for pedestrians and just to make sure we're thinking about that, not just sort of street lighting, which tends to like shine everywhere. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the pedestrian concern related to that as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for those two points. And there's been some discussion and sharing of uh, references in the chat regarding street trees. So we will definitely capture those and make sure that we uh, take a look at those items. And I did notice in the chat that Miriam had a question regarding how is this plan going to change the future construction of data centers related to looks like potential environmental impacts. And that is something that this policy plan amendment will be uh, looking into. So more to come as we work through that topic of data centers, not only for the environment, but also conceptually at a large scale with land use planning as well. So that is something we are definitely looking into. And there is just as an FYI, a um, appendix in the land use 
element of the policy plan regarding uh, some components for data centers. So we already have some existing policy language that is used. So we will be um, taking a look at that as part of this process. So thank you, Miriam, for, for mentioning that as well. Uh, let's see who we might have with their hand up next. I see Elizabeth, if you would like to unmute. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I have a couple things I wanted to, um, um, the comment that Keith had made about asking VDOT to shift to impervious surfaces from impervious to permeable and green roads. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a, there's a few pieces on that. Like when I was looking at the picture from Capital One, you know, the design, like that sidewalk could be permeable and it, it didn't, I, I couldn't tell if it was permeable, but that like it seems like also looking in building design and encouraging people to look at that, um, you know, as they're making sidewalks or trails or whatever, if there's a way to look for that um, would be great, you know, because that helps in addition to having the street trees and making it an attractive area. Um, <clears throat> But also like when you look at parking lots, like the farmer's market, this summer I was there at the McLean farmer's market. It was really, really hot one day. And the some of those farmers, like their produce is ruined because of that. So just talking about like also looking at um, parking lots and things like that, like there's ways I think that you can paint them in white or something like that. So it's more, um, you know, it's it's less heat absorbing. So just thinking about ways to make parks and um, areas like that, uh, maybe that goes into the park section, but um, that comment. Um, then also I'm a huge tree proponent and I um, just encourage you to be looking at trees for stormwater management. And, you know, there was a comment that there's only so much we're allowed to do. I would say, like, as you're looking at something and you think you can't do it now, I hope you're putting it on the legislative committee to be talking about it so that we can change that because there are so many things that if tree, you know, we could improve, you know, trees are helping with pollution, health, um, you know, absorbing water, reducing the impact of big rain, you know, increasing all the, you know, porousness of the, of the dirt or whatever, and, you know, helping with storm water runoff. And so I think we got to focus on that. It worries me when you talk about expediting building permits, because my view is that when you expedite building permits, probably the surrounding area is less viewed, you know, that might be something that gets cut off. So I encourage you to make sure that you're, you're focusing on the trees. Um, and, you know, the other part is, I love native trees, and we should be doing native trees. But honestly, it worries me that the, you know, guidelines say you get, you know, 150% credit for putting in a native tree. Well, that means you're putting in fewer trees because they're getting more credit. I think it's fantastic. Like, I think it's great to incentivize, but I worry that sometimes incentives may, especially, I mean, this falls more in the infill building develop, you know, building, but also, you know, parks or whatever, that if you're somehow counting a native tree as counting as more than just what it is, that's, that's risky. And I think just thinking about the fact that when you're taking down a mature tree, you know, it's not just the canopy, it's the whole vertical structure and all that it's providing for wildlife, et cetera. So yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, a lot of really good points there. Um, I appreciate that. And we'll definitely um, jot a couple of those down for sure. Um, moving on next to Mary. Yeah, hi folks. I'm Mary Payton. I'm with the uh, housing chair of the Fairfax NACP. And I'm, I guess I'm into the equity category, which is kind of blank right now. And I know the, the policy plan uh, is a, a background, a set of standards for the 
comprehensive uh, plan reviews, and it's all around new development. And I'm just wondering, a lot of the uh, lower income people in the county live in the older areas and the older apartments uh, because they're less expensive. And how, how can the policy plan be used as a framework um, for older areas? Do they have to wait to be redeveloped or is there some way it can be a reference, you know, say for a grant or for a, um, getting incentives for things to happen in certain neighborhoods that are farther behind to get upgraded, like in terms of trees or pedestrian lighting? Uh, how, how is this whole mega plan Meta plan referred to by uh, planners and policymakers um, in the absence of new development for the older areas, or is it? Hi, Mary. Yes, thanks for that. So, um, you know, Corrine and Carly can feel free to jump in. I mean, the policy plan typically, the majority of it is used for redevelopment for rezoning, special exceptions, and special permits. Um, but it does offer some guidance overall on how uh, the county, the recommended way that the county can um, redevelop across across different areas of the, of the county. That's why we also have area plans and other policy plan amendments, or I'm sorry, policy plan elements. So, and, as as we progress forward with this project, we can certainly you know, discuss other things um, related to this topic. I don't know, um, Kelly Atkinson, did you want to add something here? Yeah. Uh, hey, Mary Kelly Atkinson. Um, I just wanted to offer just a couple of points um, in talking with some of our colleagues over in stormwater planning. So we have our MS4 permit. Um, and some of the things that we ask for through the comprehensive plan in, in regards to stormwater, things like going above and above the minimum requirements using um, LID techniques, that actually scores us um, some additional uh, point considerations with our MS4 permit in terms of how we're demonstrating that we are, um, you know, meeting that. And so the, the plan has, you know, the plan has some influence there with their permitting. Um, you know, through the policy plan, we have a policy related to EV charging. Um, as you might, I think you might be aware, you know, we changed the zoning ordinance with ZMOD to include EV parking as part of the parking tabulation. So there are some things that have come out of the policy plan that have influenced um, other county policies or other county regulations. Um, so your, your point's well taken. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to speak for OEC, but I think some of the things that they're doing with CCAP and Resilient Fairfax are also kind of getting to your point of kind of going back and, and looking at some of the areas where we know we, um, where we have heat island effects and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, putting at least establishing the framework to try to address some of the concerns that you've mentioned. So thank you. Yes, thanks, Mary. Um, moving on next, again, we have about uh, 15 minutes left on this call, so I want to make sure we're trying to uh, give everyone an opportunity. Paul, if you're on the line, I would like to unmute. Thank you. Um, my name is Paul Atelsic. I'm a member of the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. And uh, Corrine made a comment earlier about, well, we don't control the building codes. I, I assume you're all kind of familiar with the Dillon rule. Um, there, there are a lot because of the way our state laws are, there are a lot of things that we can't do by ourselves unilaterally in Fairfax. And um, in the past, I've I've been in meetings with, uh, you know, county uh, leaders who sort of throw up their hands and they say the Dillon rule, sorry, you know, we can't do that. This is not a comment on, uh, you know, any particular element, but, you know, what I'm saying is uh, that when you see something that makes sense in any of these categories, don't throw up your hands. The Dillon rule doesn't mean that you can't get an exception for Fairfax or you can't ask the legislature to make a change. 
So I'm I'm echoing what Elizabeth said about get it on the legislative agenda if there's something you want to do and somebody tells you Dylan rule can't do that uh yes you can you just have to get it on the agenda that's it okay thanks Paul appreciate that um Let's see again. Let's move to Elaine. Sorry, I had trouble finding my mic there. Um, I just wanted to reiterate a little bit and that in this in this planning, we, we need to be looking at as we're looking at land development and everything is being pushed to this higher density and bringing more people in that we don't overlook what's there. Um, there was a mention in the chat about data centers. That's a good one that that we're putting what would normally have been in an industrial type use with people right next to it. Now we've got gas stations where, as far as I can tell right now, there's no setback requirements, but that's something that really needs to be looked at for the air quality for the people that are living right there. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, even these transit focal points where we have commuter garages, there's going to be an accumulation of more air pollution in that area. And I'm not saying we don't do those things. I'm not saying there isn't some balance, but there needs to be a, an awareness as we start moving people into areas, especially now where we've got what were commercial areas and had businesses operating, and now we're putting people right next to there. That that is looked at, and I don't I don't see a place where that's happening right now. And we have cases in Franconia where proposals are on the plate right now to put apartment buildings, abutting gas stations and across from gas stations, and it's not being considered. So I just say there was a need to look at moving people into areas with businesses that it may not be appropriate or there need, need to be some sort of setbacks. Thank you. Right. OK, great, Elaine. Yes, um, we appreciate that comment spe specifically for that particular area of the county as well. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, let's see here. I see Larry next with his hand up. Yes, um, I, I just wanted to ask about the um, the objectives that you have. Um, so if I look at the current list of objectives in the policy plan and I compare them to the ones that you have listed, they are different and so i take it that these are proposed and you're open to comment on these that's one question and i also wanted to make a comment that it seems to me that uh, the county has divided up climate and energy into two areas one is ccap and the other one is resilience and so it seems like those are fairly broad areas and I was thinking those probably warrant an objective level treatment. I was hoping you could comment on those two things. Um, I was going to yeah. ask which slide was being referenced on that because the one slide that had the all the object objectives listed um, are the yes. yeah that one. That is what is in the environment element right now. Um, I was thinking, so, the, but the. Or the other slide. So, but the environment element has not been reviewed in many years, more than a decade. And so green buildings was not part of that. So I'm, I guess I'm, I'm just having a disconnect right now. If I go to the comprehensive plan, the policy plan, there are uh, close to close to 13 or 14 elements in it, and they're different than these. So might be these are summarized like a title given to them. So objective 13 is not necessarily called green buildings, but it's talking about constructing buildings and sites sustainably. We can put a link in the chat to the policy plan environment element, which will be the current element, which is has these objectives. 
Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Okay, great. Thanks, Larry. Um, let's see here. Eric, I see your hand is raised next. Um, have a have a number of uh, uh, of points, uh, particularly on 13C, which is in the uh, uh, green building. Uh, given the importance or the, the 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 importance of climate change, I think really many of those uh, um, attributes of green buildings ought to be either eliminated or downplayed. And energy efficiency, greenhouse gas reduction, and renewable energy should be emphasized. Uh, in the section about um, uh, anyway, a, a second issue is uh, reducing impervious surfaces as much as possible and increasing canopy, whether that's tree canopy or solar canopy, ought to be something that, uh, of concern. Uh, there's a need to mention the most recent FEMA flood maps. Uh, a specific recommendation would be, while we are recommending, I think, uh, lead silver, that if there were a specific incentive for high performance on energy efficiency domains in the Green Building Council's uh, 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 building codes, that doesn't mean that we're going outside of what uh, the USBC is, but it says that we're going to incent high scoring on the energy efficiency components. I want to reinforce what people have said about uh, renewables and solar. In any way, we can um, encourage that on lighting. I think there ought to be mention of uh, the dark sky and the emphasis on reducing uh, light pollution that goes any place other than down towards the ground. And finally, uh, there's an importance which uh, other speakers have, have mentioned uh, of uh, one Fairfax and equity uh, throughout, and uh, their specific uh, places. Uh, the most recent uh, Park Authority has talked about the inequitable availability of green space to people who are low income and uh, marginalized populations. So green space and park equitable access uh, could be something uh, emphasized. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for all your points. I appreciate that all that feedback. Um, and then the last person I see right now with their hand raised is Ting. Thanks for your patience, Ting. Uh, it's okay. Um, hi. I just wanted to put a plug in, and I think it sounds like you're going to be doing this already. Um, but the word climate is not even to be found in the previous environmental policy plan. I really think that we need to be um, actually <laughs> saying that word out loud um, when we're talking about both um, emissions reduction and resilience that we need to be um, considering over the next decades. Um, and I also wanted to say a word about um, the encouragement of low emissions equipment outside of buildings and cars. I'm thinking especially about lawn equipment um, and just the like tremendously high emissions of um, gas powered leaf blowers in particular. Um, but I don't, if there could be a place for that, I know a lot of municipalities have um, begun phasing out or outright banned already. Um, leaf blowers and some kind of supporting of the use of low emissions equipment would be um, my recommendation. Um, and also love loved hearing a lot of other great recommendations today. Yes, I agree. Thank you so much, Ting. And just going through the chat, you know, we, we definitely will capture some of the comments in here regarding, you know, incentivizing trees um, and specifically the mature trees and the preservation of them, um, the lighting, you know, we've had a couple good points today about not only um, low ambient lighting, and, but striking a balance between lighting needed for pedestrians versus um, the animals and wildlife, um, and then the bird sensitive uh, 
windows are is a good great point as well. Um, we will take a look at some of the conversations regarding the lead certification. So thank you for that. As you know, obviously we do ask and request that often and have been very successful over the years and been and being able to obtain various levels of lead certification. So thank you for all of those notes. Um, let's see here. Okay, and I do not see anyone else with their hand up. So with that- Can I just we... say something? I, oh. I just wanna thank all the other public members that are on this meeting. I have attended, I think, every one of these policy meetings in one area you know, like maybe not both of the sessions, but one area. And this has been the largest participation I have seen by far. So I just thank you all for giving your time. Thanks. Thank you, Elaine. Likewise, I agree. <laughs> um, appreciate that. And, you know, with that, we would love to give you all a few more minutes back in your lunch hour. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Kareen, could you advance the slide deck one more so that we could just give a quick reminder, yes, of the links to the policy plan amendment where you can learn not only just more about the environment element and the work we're doing here with, the, with that topic area, but also our other topic areas that we're working on. Um, and then feel free to, take a look at the current policy plan. It sounds like many of you have taken a peek at it. So we appreciate all of the um, pre-work you all have done. And we hope you sign up for, um, or uh, you know, send additional thoughts that you may have to the uh, email below, thepublicinput.com, that will help us continue to get feedback as we go forward. And again, we all appreciate your time so much. Keep an eye out for any future meetings we might have in the um, in the upcoming months and into 2025. So, thank you all very much, Kareen and Carly. If you had anything else to say, feel free. No, just thank you all for joining us. Yeah, I think we have a record attendance. So yay, yay for us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, thank you for the dialogue in the chat. Um, it looks like we're heading in the right direction for some areas, which is encouraging and and some other areas to, to look at further. So definitely appreciate it. Thank you yes. all. Thanks. Thank you. Take thank care. You.